Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with my February wrap-up. I will tell you in truth, February was not a great reading month for me. I think I read plenty of books. None of them were very memorable. None of them were really great. Uh, I did have, I think, one standout, so that's really exciting. But other than that, this has been a fairly forgettable month. And I think historically, February is generally a pretty forgettable month for me. It definitely was last year. I think you always start out the year strong. In January, you're really excited about reading. You're really excited about making sure that the year gets started off right in terms of the books that you're picking up. But I think February, you're starting to feel like this is just a regular month and a regular year. But let's just get right into it. The romantic poet that I decided to focus on in February was John Keats. This is because it was actually the bicentennial of uh, Keats's death in February. And so in honor of his death, I decided to treat myself and I jumped ahead to read some of his most famous poetry. I have been trying with the romantic poets to kind of read their works chronologically and thus give them all equal playing field in my opinion. I'm not sure that that really works. And so I decided just because it was the bicentennial of Keats's death that I should read some of his more famous poetry because the poetry towards the beginning of his career has been fine, but I wouldn't say this was groundbreaking, and I think that's going to be the unfortunate thing uh, with me and Keats, is that I think he's been overhyped to me to a degree because so many people love him. For so many people, Keats is their ultimate poet, not just of this generation, but of all time. Uh, and so I don't know that I've read enough of him yet to be able to make that call for myself, but I did read the odes this month. The odes are some of his most famous poetry. Probably the most famous of the odes is the Ode to a Nightingale, but that was not my favorite. My favorite was actually the Ode on Melancholy, uh, followed by Ode on a Grecian Urn which I knew I was going to like, and I really do. Uh, but I found myself comparing Ode on a Grecian Urn to Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. There's really no need to compare them at all because Ozymandias is a really, really short poem. And Ode on a Grecian Urn is a little bit longer with a different kind of structure. And so really there's no need to compare them. But I felt like they were trying to do kind of a similar thing, filling in the blanks where we don't know specifics in terms of history. Uh, and so I really, really love Ozymandias. Uh, and so it wasn't as good as Ozymandias to me, unfortunately, but I really loved Ode on Melancholy. I mean, that was just exquisitely beautiful to me. Uh, and so maybe my experience with Keats will be that the kind of big names won't be the ones that I love so much, but I will love the lesser known ones. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think I'm going to get along with Keats. I just think that I need to read more of him, but I found it really wonderful to explore um, the odes this month, especially in honor of the bicentennial of his death. Then I read The Jewel of the Seven Stars by Bram Stoker. This was suggested to me on Audible Plus as a free audiobook, and I took it because February ended up being a very mummy-oriented month for me. I watched The Mummy two or three times, if I'm not mistaken, uh, actually right back to back. So I was definitely in the mood for something that would kind of scratch that itch. Uh, and so this is one of Bram Stoker's novels that of course, I have not heard very much about. I think really there's only one of Bram Stoker's novels that we still really remember, but he was very, very popular at the time. And so this is his book about a female mummy. And I had really high hopes for it. I thought it was going to at least be a fun romp, but it was very slow. And I think the unfortunate thing is, is it's slow because we as the modern reader no, it's going to be a mummy. We know what the creature is. And so there's no suspense in that. But it's like he did the same thing multiple times to build suspense. That got old fairly quickly to me. And in general, I actually would say I thought the book was too short. I think it should have leaned into some details. I think it should have expanded on some things. Uh, and I did like the fact that he played with a lot of really iconic tropes in the mummy genre uh, that we now associate very fully with the mummy genre. I liked what he did with them. And I actually found several of the characters' names 
to be familiar to me. So I'm kind of wondering if this was really an influence on especially the film genre. This one is a weird one and I'm not quite sure how it compares to Dracula. I didn't like Dracula either, but I do think Dracula on the whole was better. Dracula also suffers from a similar thing where we as the modern audience have it figured out and we know exactly what Dracula is. Well, we also know in this book what the mummy is and who the mummy is actually. And so a little bit of the suspense is taken out for us, but I think overall Dracula is more successful and there's a reason why we've heard of Dracula more than the Jewel of the Seven Stars, but this was really unfortunate. I rated this two stars. I then picked up Heretics and Heroes by Thomas Kael, and he is a historian who has kind of a series ongoing where he's covering all of these big time periods in history and he's kind of trying to shift the focus onto smaller groups. I think his most famous book is actually about Ireland and how Irish civilization and Irish people really preserved learning in the Dark Ages and thus paved the way for the Renaissance, which I think is a really, really interesting concept. Uh, and I also like the fact that he wants to kind of twist focus away from the big names. This is his book on the Renaissance, uh, and he did not twist away from the big names at all here. Of course, how can you? Uh, nearly anybody that you can name from the Renaissance was a big name at one time or another. I would say somebody like Erasmus has definitely faded in modern day, but was a massive, massive name at the time and has been historically. He's always been studied. And so there's a lot of this book that focuses on Erasmus. A lot of this book focuses on Martin Luther. Um, there is a large portion of this book that focuses on art and the big names in art. He tries to do too much in too short a time. And though this is definitely intended to be a beginner's book, I think it would work really well for a beginner because he does kind of hit the greatest hits, so to speak, of the Renaissance era. I think it would have served him better to hone in a little bit on what he wanted to do. And I think he really wanted to tell the story of the Protestant Reformation, and I think that's the book that he should have written. I don't think he was overall interested in the Renaissance as a whole. I don't think he was particularly interested in Italy uh, or really in France, which is interesting from the Protestant Reformation aspect because a lot went on there. I also had a big problem with how blatant his opinions were. I mean, often you read nonfiction, you read historical nonfiction, and you can tell the historian wants you to come away with a certain viewpoint, you know, maybe about a certain figure. But in this, in nearly every chapter, he was telling you exactly what he thought about people and what you should think about people. This was particularly blatant to me in his chapter about art because he kind of goes down the greatest hits of the Renaissance uh, and he really, really disparages Botticelli. And he kind of says like, why are we talking about Botticelli alongside Michelangelo? And in a way, maybe you're right because Michelangelo is a jack of all trades and he could do everything. But I'm not really reading this book to get your opinion on Botticelli and whether you believe he should stand among the greats of the Renaissance because whether you believe it or not, he is. Uh, and so I think, again, if that was the book you wanted to write, write that book. Don't try to smush everything together. This felt like maybe two or three books that had been Frankensteined together and made incredibly short so that you weren't given very much detail. But I had just a big problem with how blatant his opinions were. I mean, he literally would say, and I could tell because I was listening to this on an audiobook, I could tell that he kind of broke in in parentheses and says, hey, don't think about it like this, or I don't believe this. I don't believe this really happened. And you're thinking, am I reading this for your personal take on events? Because as a beginner's book, I shouldn't be. If this is somebody's introduction to the time period, I should not be reading your opinion so blatantly. Uh, I should be trying to figure those things out for myself. And then when I get into more specific studies, the historian can try to really persuade me of something. And this was a bit of a disappointment to me. I also rated this two stars. I then picked up another two star book, which is Don't Call the Wolf by Alexandra Ross. This was one of my most anticipated releases of last year. It is kind of a Russian or Polish inspired fantasy. And so I typically really get on with that. And I'm always looking for more kind of Polish inspired fantasies. I really, really like Polish inspired fantasies. And so actually there is a lot to this book that I truly could have enjoyed. It's told from two viewpoints. One of them 
is immensely interesting and you want to stay with that character the whole book. In my opinion anyway, he was the character that I connected to and the other viewpoint I just felt like was a waste of my time for the most part until a certain point in the story. But what's really unfortunate about this is that she threw everything but the kitchen sink in this book in terms of kind of Polish, Russian, Eastern European mythology. She took every creature that she could think of she threw it in this book. And not just in kind of a one-off sentence way that was really more world building than anything else. All of the creatures that she mentioned eventually did something in this story. And I think it would have been to her benefit if she had cherry picked a few of the ones that she really, really wanted to showcase and she had just stuck with that. I think that would have made this a much stronger book and I think it would have made my enjoyment of it go up. But I just found so much of this exhausting and I felt like so much was going on. I mean, really way too much was going on, which is a sad thing to say because I actually think the world was very interesting. And that one main character that I talked about, I found very compelling and I really would have been interested in reading more about him and his story. But there was just a lot going on. This is another one that felt like a couple of books stitched into one. In some ways, I think this book should have been given more room to breathe. But in others, I felt like I stayed with it for far too long. I just felt like it was such a long book. This was really unfortunate, especially for it to have been an anticipated release last year. Uh, so I don't think I will be carrying on with this series if it actually is a series. I got the sense that it was a standalone, but I think maybe a sequel will come out. I don't know, uh, but I definitely won't carry on if it does become a series, unfortunately. Then I read An Affair of Poisons by Addie Thorley, and I thoroughly enjoyed this. This is historical fantasy, but it is much more fantasy in my opinion than it is historical. Not so much in terms of magical elements. I think that leads you to believe there's a lot of magic in this book, and I think it's pretty low on that actually. But this changes so much that happened historically that I really don't even know we can call it historical fiction. Uh, so this is set during the reign of Louis XIV. And an interesting thing actually happened in the true reign of Louis XIV that had to do with poison. Uh, and so this book is definitely playing with that and going much further with it. But we have two main characters. One main character is the daughter of kind of the poisoner at Louis XIV's court, and she accidentally creates the poison that kills Louis XIV when he's still pretty much in his prime. This is still the 1600s. Uh, and then the other perspective is kind of the illegitimate child of Louis XIV who didn't exist historically. Uh, and so this book really kind of deals with them going back and forth. Of course, you can sense there is definitely going to be a romance, but this book really goes in and changes everything about the French court and French history of the time period. It kills so many really prominent and important courtiers from this time period. It basically, I think, wanted to smush the actual French Revolution with the time period of Louis XIV. And so when it did that, it really swept out anybody that you would have known on a name recognition basis other than a few people in this from Louis XIV's court. And so I think the unfortunate thing is this bears absolutely no resemblance to what kind of the France, the Paris of the late 1600s was. And so I think this book would have been better served by being set in a fantasy world. That's my personal opinion. And it definitely is a personal thing because I personally don't understand why you would want to set a book in a particular time period and then destroy everything about it that probably attracted you to it in the first place. And I've read some reviews from French reviewers who did not like this at all. And I definitely understand why, because this really did some very odd things, but I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed them as characters. I felt like they were so fully fleshed out. The two main characters we just felt so vibrant and real. And often I think, it feels a little bit hollow when you have a character who wants to do good. I think it feels a little bit like I'm doing this because I should or I crafted this character in a way because there has to be somebody in the narrative that you can root for. So somebody has to be decent. But I really felt like these characters 
fought to be decent. They really wrestled with guilt. They wrestled with the things that they had done. And then they came to an understanding that felt really natural and organic. And their relationship was one that you also found yourself rooting for because they came from essentially the same background. And thus, it felt like the only other character in the narrative that could possibly understand them is their love interest. This felt really well constructed in terms of romance, in my opinion. It also felt really well constructed in terms of plot. I really, really enjoyed it. My problem with it was just kind of how she twisted the historical events. And I think that's largely what has bothered French reviewers with this. This is a standalone, which was also really refreshing. I love a historical fantasy, so I always enjoy it, even if it does something that I don't really like. But uh, I love France and I love French history and I love specifically the reign of Louis XIV. Uh, so to me, this was a very vibrant setting and I could very easily picture it. She goes to a lot of really famous places in Paris, Versailles, of course. Uh, and so it's just a really fun book. I just had a lot of fun on reading this. And I have another book from Addie Thorley on my shelf, which is apparently her retelling of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I hope that Addie Thorley just decides to kind of stick with twisting French history and going with French classics, because I think we need more of that. I don't think we have enough kind of French inspired fantasy on the market. Uh, so I really enjoyed this, but I did think parts of it would have worked better had she just set this in a real fantasy world. Next, I read Juliet by Anne Fortier, and this is a book that has been recommended to me so many times over the years, and I can't believe it's taken me this long to pick it up, and I just absolutely adored it. Uh, so this was probably also, I would say, a three-star read, uh, and I really, really enjoyed this. This is a book that is supposedly telling the real story of Juliet from Romeo and Juliet, and so the interesting thing is this book decides that the kind of Romeo and Juliet story has its heart in a real Sienese family rivalry. So two families in Siena in the Middle Ages rather than in Verona. And I actually heard about these two families and their rivalry when I went to Siena because one of the families, at least, still exists and owns the bank there. And it's the oldest bank in the world. It's really incredible. But at one of their kind of palazzi, their palazzo, I believe, under the steps, right where you would kind of walk into the house, they buried the family of their enemy. So they buried essentially the entire family. They massacred an entire section of the family that they hated and then buried them under the steps. And she actually kind of plays with that here. A massacre of their family is kind of the background to one of the Romeo and Juliet characters. Uh, and so this is essentially told in a dual timeline. And so it's partially taking place kind of now in the modern day, and then it's also partially taking place uh, in the medieval period, telling you the real story of Romeo and Juliet, uh, which is not nearly as compelling as the Romeo and Juliet of Shakespeare. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. I actually prefer the modern storyline, which is unusual for me with a dual timeline narrative, especially with one set in the Middle Ages. But in the modern day, a woman is essentially finding out about her connection to one of these families and her connection to Juliet specifically. And so it's a little bit about history kind of repeating itself. Uh, and so it plays with a lot of really interesting ideas. And I found the modern day storyline so compelling because I really wanted to find out the mystery. I found the mystery elements of this to be done very well, but I did not find the character elements of it to be done very well at all because I didn't care about any of the characters. I didn't like any of the characters. I'm not quite sure whether or not that was her intent or if she just kind of used them as a vehicle for the mystery, the story that she wanted to tell, but I didn't find any of the characters compelling in either narrative. The number one reason I love this, other than the mystery, which really kept me guessing, I loved this because it was set in Siena. And I just thought kind of the imagery of the city, it was so beautifully described. I felt like I was there. They went to a lot of really famous places in Siena and a lot of famous places in Siena had real bearing on the plot and real bearing on kind of the story of Romeo and Juliet. So it was really interesting to kind of think about Romeo and Juliet taking place in Siena and how interesting that would be. But the craziest thing about this for me personally was uh, I was listening to this book while I was working one day and they kept talking about the hotel uh, that the girl was staying in in the modern day and they described something, they described the entryway I believe to the hotel and I thought to myself, I said, now 
was that the hotel I stayed in? Because I wouldn't have pronounced it the way the audiobook narrator did. So I looked it up and on the author's website, they confirmed that the character actually stayed at the hotel that I stayed at when I visited Siena, which was the craziest thing I've ever heard. I have never in my life had anywhere that I stayed like appear in fiction. I just thought that was really, really cool. And I loved that hotel. It was a really wonderful hotel. It was the Hotel Chiusarelli. So I just really enjoyed returning to Siena in this book. I'm very easy to please in that you can essentially tell me something is set in Italy and I think I'll be pretty happy with it. But I found this to be a very compelling mystery and I highly recommend this. I just really enjoyed it. And I also really enjoyed the audiobook experience. Audiobooks were my best friend this past month uh, and they're how I got through reading it all basically. Uh, and so I just really enjoyed this and I do highly recommend it. I also read Malice by John Gwynn, which is the first book in an adult fantasy series. And this book has been sold to me, this series has been sold to me many times over as a Viking series. A lot of people have recommended this to me over the years saying, oh, you love the Vikings, why don't you read John Gwynn? And I really like John Gwynn personally. I followed him on social media for years and he is a Viking reenactor, but this book has no Vikings in it. There are some people who are kind of vague Viking illusions, or at least pirates. Really, what are Vikings but pirates? But that's where it stops. This is not a Viking series, and I really don't think you should go into it expecting to see Vikings. You see Celtic stuff, I would say. I think this is very heavy on Celtic mythology, Celtic names, uh, Welsh mythology perhaps in particular, uh, which is really, really interesting. And it's also very heavy on biblical mythology, in my opinion. There's a very interesting background to kind of the overarching plot and what's been going on in the world and this fight between good and evil that you feel is very biblical. Uh, and also he quotes from Paradise Lost at the beginning of the book and I said, okay, I kind of know what I'm getting into here. And so I really enjoyed the ideas here and I loved everything he was playing with once I got over the fact that there were no Vikings in this book. But on a character level, I didn't connect at all. And I didn't care anything about the characters. And it's kind of left me bereft because the books are really long. So now I don't really know whether or not I'll continue on in this series because I just didn't really care. When things happened to people, I wasn't stressed out about it. And I wasn't really all that excited to get back to reading the book when I put it down, which is always a little bit of a bad sign. This is not a bad book. In fact, I would say it's a three star read. So it's definitely good. But I don't know that it was for me personally. And I've been looking at other people's reviews and it appears that I'm the odd one out. Most people didn't care anything about the plot, but they cared about the characters in this first book. And I found myself feeling you know completely the opposite I thought at least the plot was kind of compelling and I felt like there was a lot of plot I felt like it was very quick moving uh, and thus I didn't feel like there was enough of a pause for character work in my opinion or character development I do think there was development but I don't think it was done in a way that I appreciate I think everything was done very rapidly which is an interesting thing to say for a book of this size i had really really high hopes for this and so some of this is my own expectations being way too high for it but uh john Gwynn does in fact have a viking book coming out this year uh, and i just got approved for an arc of it and that i can't wait to dive into he does in fact have a viking series coming out but this series i would definitely say uh, is more celtic welsh uh Irish even, a little bit Irish. And you can definitely tell that in some of the names, but it's not a Viking fantasy at all. But you will be pleased to hear that I found a Viking fantasy that I absolutely loved. This is my five star of the month. This was my success. It is The Last Light of the Sun by Guy Gabriel Kay. Truly, this book could not have been any more exquisite. And this is one I want to kind of preface by saying I don't know that I'm being objective about it because on an objective level, were the characters very strong? Probably not. But what I really liked here was the writing style. Uh, and this is essentially... I would almost call this historical fantasy. I don't think you can call it that because it takes place in a true other world fantasy world it doesn't take place in our world at all but uh it's definitely not very heavy on fantastical elements and he is trying to tell a very particular story about a very particular period in time and that period in time is during alfred the great's reign 
uh, and basically the great heathen army because there is an Ira the Boneless character in here. There is also an Alfred character in here. And so much of it bears such strong resemblance to what happened in real life. I was left questioning why he didn't just write this as historical fiction. I think perhaps he figured fantasy would sell better and that's probably true, but really nothing that happened in this book was out of the realm of possibility. I think he could have gone with straight historical fiction because there were magical elements in it, but they were a little bit like, I would say maybe a Juliet Marillier level of fantastical elements and those kinds of fantastical elements. If you've read anything by her, you probably know what I'm referring to. And in general, I would say this book is a good comp for Juliet Marillier because the writing here is just so beautiful. I mean, literally, there was a whole entire page on a blood eagle, which is a really horrible, savage way to die, you know, that the Vikings could inflict on you. And they saved it for people who had really earned it. And this book is kind of tossed about willy-nilly uh, by the Ira the Boneless character because he doesn't really see it as something really, you know, grand. Uh, but in actual Viking society, the Blood Eagle was saved for somebody who was really, really awful. And the Blood Eagle was performed by Ivor the Boneless, actually, in the sagas on the man who killed his father, uh, which was seen as a really, you know, big moment. There's basically this whole sequence here that's about the Blood Eagle, and it's also a little bit about how times have been changing. Times are gradually uh, moving forward. A really big theme in this book is kind of time moving on past you. And so a lot of this book, a lot of the characters are kind of older warriors who had success back in the day, and their names are already fading because people are dying. People no longer remember the battles they fought. And so they are kind of passing on their mantle to the next generation of warriors. And almost every character Character in this book is doing something for somebody of the previous generation. They are taking revenge for kind of the death of their grandfather, or they are doing something for their father who was exiled. There is so much here, but I am going to read you this passage about the Blood Eagle because it just floored me. And I can't really say why because it's not particularly beautiful, but I just really loved it. Ingevin and Thunir were many things, they're the gods, but they were soul reapers before all else. And the ravens that followed them, the birds of the battlefield and the banners were emblems of that. So was the blood eagle, a sacrifice and a message, a vanquished king or war leader stripped naked under the holy sky, thrown on the ground, his face to the churned earth. If he wasn't dead, he would be restrained by strong warriors or with ropes tied to pegs hammered into the earth or both. His back would be carved vertically with a long knife or an ax. The bloody openings pulled wide, his ribs cracked back on each side, and his lungs drawn out through the opening thus made. They would be draped upon the exposed cage of his ribs, the folded wings of an eagle, blood crimson, God offering. It was said that Seeger Volgenson, the Volgen, had been so precise and swift in performing the ritual that some of his victims remained alive for a time with their lungs exposed to the watching gods. Ivar had not yet been able to achieve this. In fairness, he'd had less opportunity than his grandfather had enjoyed during the years and seasons of the great raids. Times changed. It's just incredible to me, the world building that happened in that passage, the character development that happened in that passage. Like it told me so much about Ivar as a person or Ivar. Some people will pronounce it Ivar and I'm really torn on what I should do because on the show they pronounce it Ivar. Uh, but I think most Scandinavians say Ivar, but uh, it told me so much about him like being kind of sloppy. And I get the sense things like the Volgan are references back to kind of Volsanga Saga. It is just so absolutely fabulous. There was another part that was talking about the Alfred the Great character. Maybe I'll read that to you too, because it was also just absolutely beautiful. The King of the Angleson would not have denied that his soul, housed in a body that racked and betrayed him so often, had been marked from childhood during that long ago journey through the intricate seductions of the South. He was king of a precarious, dispersed, unlettered people in a winter-shaped, beleaguered land, and he wanted to be more. He wanted them to be more, his Angleson of this island, and given three generations of peace, he thought it possible. He had made decisions for more than 25 years, denying his heart and soul sometimes with that in mind. He would answer to Jad, or God, for all of it, not far in the future now, and he didn't think three generations would be allowed them. Not in these northern lands, this boneyard of war. 
He lived his life fighting through impediments, including these fevers, in defiance of that bitter thought, as if to will it not to be so, envisaging the God and his chariot under the world, battling through evils every single night to bring back the sun to the world he had made. This book is just hauntingly beautiful. Uh, I think it really would have worked well as historical fiction, but that's because I'm partial to Alfred the Great. But I think truly this is one of my favorite portrayals of Alfred the Great ever. And he's not even really referred to as Alfred the Great. You're just kind of left to really figure that out for yourself but it's just amazing. His portrayal of Alfred the Great, he gets him. He truly gets him. And he also really gets Ivar in a really interesting way. And I think what he did with these people, with these historical figures, with these characters out of myth, it was just exquisite. I mean, truly, this was a beautiful book. This was my first Guy Gabriel K. It will not be my last, but I do think this will probably remain my favorite because I am so partial to the Viking Age, and I am particularly partial to Alfred the Great and Ivor the Boneless. They are two of my historical faves, uh, and so this book really dealt with them and really gave them a spotlight, shone a light on them in a really, really interesting and intriguing way that I actually don't think could have been done through historical fiction, uh, so I really, really appreciated what this book did. But I've heard so many things about Guy Gabriel Kay's other works. I think he has several works set in a fictionalized version of Renaissance Italy, and I know I will probably enjoy those. Uh, so I really, really loved this. This was my big success of the month. Last but not least, I read A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass. This is the newest book in her ACOTAR series. And I really enjoyed this. I didn't enjoy it as much as I hoped to. Uh, this book focuses on Nesta, who I don't think many people really like, but Nesta is probably my favorite character from the Akatar series. And in fact, she's probably my favorite fictional character from the past few years. I just love her. She's really incredibly mean and vicious, but I really like a mean female character, and I think female characters like Nesta are extremely compelling to me. I'm not sure why, but they are typically my favorite types of female characters, so I really, really liked Nesta. But this book focuses mainly on her romance with a character called Cassian, uh, and I think that was probably the least successful aspect of the book to me. Not that it was bad or that it was poorly portrayed, because I think at the end of the day, this series is now basically paranormal romance or fantasy romance and the romance is largely why people are reading this series and I think it's why people read this book but I found the character development with Nesta to be so meaningful that the relationship that she formed with Cassie and fell by the wayside for me entirely because this book really kind of focused on you know healing from your trauma and I think that's something Sarah J Mass does really really well and I think she did it extremely well in an earlier book in the series A Court of Mist and Fury I thought that she did it really well there and I think she also did it extremely well in Crescent City last year uh, and so I think that's just something that she has a gift with I think she really has a gift with characters I truly do but there was an aspect of this book where Nesta finally made friends and you kind of get the sense that Nesta is so mean and nasty that she's likely never been close to anyone even family and so for her to kind of become friends with these women it's a really big step for her to take. And these women have also been through their own kind of trauma. It was just a really powerful story to me, her bond with those women and how they became friends. And eventually at the end of the book, how strong their friendship is and how strong their understanding and their forgiveness for each other is. Uh, and you feel like Nesta the whole time is always walking on eggshells with people because she knows people will figure out she's mean and that they won't want to be around her anymore. And these women are really open and forgiving of that and understand why she's like that. And I just think this is... I mean, a really meaningful story. And I really love Nesta, so I just loved seeing this for her. I think that was the strongest aspect of the book. Other things happened. There was a bit of plot, but I was really in this for Nesta and her character development, and it did not disappoint me in that regard. I will say, this book is the most adult I have ever read by Sarah J. Mass. There are so many explicit scenes in this book that it's really 
overkill. There's too many of them. But I think this is also the first book in this series, and also really the first book from Sarah J. Mass in general, that really heavily leans into the romance genre and admits that it is actually, in fact, a romance book. Uh, and so I think it leans pretty heavily into that, and I think maybe she's trying to tell her readers this is what she wants to do from now on. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was going to be a five-star read, though, and unfortunately it was not. It was only four stars, but it was still very enjoyable. So those were all of the books that I read in February. Here's to hoping that March is a better reading month all around. I would love to know if you have read any of these, and I would also love to know what your favorite book that you read this month was. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.